Today's episode is brought to you by Anchor. Guys, now what is Anchor, you ask? It's the fastest way, easiest way to create a podcast. Everyone always asks me, how did you start your podcast? Where did you start your podcast? It's Anchor, guys. That's what I use. Um, It's the easiest place to create a podcast ever. One thing I love about it, it's free. The second thing is it's easy distribution. You one click, it gets you to all the other platforms, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher. The next, it has like this creation tool. So you can edit your podcast, record your podcast from your phone or on a computer if you want. Like I said earlier, guys, it's the easiest place to record a podcast. All you have to do is download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm and start your podcast. It's that simple. Now let's get in to the show. Hey, Alexa, what's the definition of hustle? To be aggressive, especially in business or other financial dealings. You're listening to the H for Hustle podcast, designed to inspire future entrepreneurs to take the leap from working for someone else to pursue their passions and side hustles and turning them into full-fledged businesses. My name is Jerome Fenton. I'm a serial entrepreneur. Every week, I'll be speaking with an entrepreneur that has taken that leap. We'll be talking about the lessons they've learned and how they've turned their passions and side hustles into full-fledged businesses. H for Hustle Podcast. Welcome back. Back, back, back. Another illustrious episode up ahead. Head, 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 Guys, head, before I jump into today's episode, I have to ask a favor. I don't really ask much favors from you guys, but I really need this one to happen. Um, I need you guys to go over to iTunes. I need you to rate, comment, subscribe, write um, a re- good review about us. Write a bad review. Write a whatever review. Just write something. I need you guys to go over to iTunes, write a review. When you write a review, it helps the podcast grow within the iTunes system. And we need this podcast to grow more and more. And how we get that is because if you guys are listening, but also that you guys leaving comments and, and, and rating and reviewing the podcast. Um, so please get over to iTunes. Do that really quickly. Um, if you can, that would be really appreciated. Also, if you don't listen to this podcast on iTunes, you listen somewhere else, just hit the subscribe button. Um, The more subscribers you get, the more the podcast grows. So just if you're on Stitcher, if you're on iTunes, if you're on Spotify, if you're on CastBox, just hit the subscribe button. That would be great. And it gives you updates on every time we drop new podcasts. So on today's episode, we have David David Summerfleck, the founder of DMS Blue. We talk about David's journey in becoming a marketing expert, digital marketing expert. Um, and he has a very you know, interesting story. I don't want to waste too much time. Let's get into David's story right now. Boom, 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 boom. H for Hustle Podcast, welcome back. Uh, we have another great guest today. We have David Summerfleck from DMS Blue. Uh, David, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Jerome. I appreciate it. All right, so David, if I was to meet you at a, I guess, a Zoom dinner these days, right? Um, <laughs> what would you sure. say you do for a living? I would probably say I'm a marketing expert, uh, but depending on how I feel, I might not say that. I might just ask you how you're doing, <laughs> and um, you know what's going on in your life right now. Got it. Um, I never really liked marketing. Um, excuse me, networking groups. Um, or networking events because people always come to them like they're shopping. <laughs> they you do. Know, I, I don't. I don't need uh, a realtor right now. So they take the realtor's card and they put it in the trash. You know, whereas it really should be about I'm um, experiencing these business problems or these challenges. Can this group help me resolve these problems or these challenges to more be a uh, business support group? Yeah. Everybody would go to a business support group, but a networking group is like, here's my business card here, here, here. And you're not really hearing what people are saying. Yeah. So I've never people, been that keen on them. Because they're not really there to connect. They're just here to distribute cards. Right. Yeah. I would probably say, my name's David. How are you? What's your name? Got him. All right. So l- let's go back a bit. Um, how, sure. how did you, before you started DMS Blue, what were you doing for a living then? 
Right. Well, <laughs> basically, um, I went to college to be a writer. I was studying Shakespeare and Chaucer and Keats and Shelley and reading everybody else I could find in my spare time. But while I was in college, I also was a big, big believer in internships to okay. help pay, pay for my books and pay for college. So I was working as many internships as I could get. And um, about halfway through college, I realized that there weren't that many jobs for writers and editors in the area in which I lived. Mm. So if I was going to make a livable wage, I had to pivot or be able to think in a different mindset. So I started thinking, okay, I need to learn about this internet thing, which was still very new in the mid nineties. So I took my background as a copywriter, you okay. know, uh, and my ability to edit and write in almost any style. Um, and then started, I started studying website development, website design and SEO, which in the mid nineties were very new. Yeah. You could, you could be, uh, you could hack, SEO and get to be number one in Yahoo, which was what ruled back then. Yeah. Pretty damn easily. There were so many tricks that you could do uh, back then. And there was so little competition. Now, the irony is that now we're in 2021. And the great irony is that the businesses and people who need to be number one in Google are the least likely to actually use it and capitalize on it, which is the, the saddest thing, really. Got it. So let's, so you went from, did you, so did you finish college majoring in writing or did you just transfer to like a marketing at that point? No, I finished uh, college. I earned a BA in English with an emphasis in creative writing from Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. We used to call it the armpit of the South. And uh, so I graduated from there. I I had two internships working at different newspapers uh, and magazines and I also volunteered at the campus radio station and with their uh, literary festival. Got it. And I met the great uh, Amiri Baraka, who was a great uh, literary lion, a great poet and uh, activist, actually was the poet laureate of uh, New Jersey, I believe. Yeah, his, his grandson, I think, is the mayor of Newark, New Jersey, Ross Baraka. Wow, I have to look yeah. that up. Yeah. I have an autograph photo of him around here somewhere because I was organizing the literary festival for the university and he was there to speak. So I had to go talk to him and say, well, where do you want to sit, Mr. Braga? You know, where do you want your table to be and everything? And he was very polite. I remember him saying, you know, who do you write for a young man? And I said, I write for myself. And he said, oh, that's the best, the best, uh, you know, the best person. Got it. That's what he's too right for. But I always admired his courage and writing quality. And so anyway, I graduated from college. And um, I by that time, I was already freelancing. I had already been begun working for local small business owners who wanted to be online uh, early back then. Got it. And so, so were you just doing their copywriting for their websites at that point? Like just writing the body? What were you doing? Building websites as well? Everything. Everything. Wow. So I've always been that holistic type of marketer. So my first job out of college, I began working for different marketing and advertising agencies. So altogether, probably around 25 years working for different marketing and advertising agencies. Now, in between those, I would work in, uh, I would work as a freelancer. And it took me quite a lot of time to learn how to apply the structure, the processes that marketing agencies use to working as an independent. Got it. How do I find if I have a big project with an enterprise level company that has 50 or more employees and a very realistic budget, how do I work with them as one person? I could recruit my wife to help, but she's not a programmer. So if I want extra help, where do I find that online? How can I put together a remote team? So it took me a couple of years to learn how to do that. And Uh, Over that time, I also was a certified small business mentor for the United States Small Business Administration. Oh, the the Um, SBA. Yeah. And I also um, 
started, uh, well, I also had my own LLC as a consultancy. And I also started a nonprofit organization at one point, providing sliding scale mediation services, because I was trained in mediation, which is resolving a court dispute, but without necessarily going to court. court. Yeah. And so I started that that lasted about two years. And it was just a horrible experience. I learned everything not to do. So I did that. Uh, And I also received training in political campaign messaging uh, through the White House project, uh, which was, I I forget how long it was, but it was exhausting. Got it. So when you went from starting, uh, so you're helping small businesses with their websites and um, how did you, were you able to like learn that? Cause back then it wasn't as easy as getting like a Squarespace or a Wix website up. It's Thank literally, you, you were doing, um, HTML coding. How did you learn all of that? Or did you have like someone that you partnered with along the way to do that? There was nobody that I could partner with at the beginning because people would come and go like the night. I mean, you would think that you had someone to partner with and then they would go under or they would move. Okay. Um, I remember vividly there was um, a realtor in uh, Colorado I met who she was finding commercial space for small businesses. So she would get, a, and she partnered with her girlfriend, and her girlfriend would go to Wix and Weebly and Squarespace and Vistaprint and everything else to get these really super cheap DIY things. And uh, so anyway, the realtor would refer business owners to her girlfriend who gave them, and I'm not exaggerating, it was a white box with a white box in the middle of it and dark gray text and black links, no images, no SEO, no e-commerce at all. And she would sell these for like three to $5,000. Wow. And as soon as the, the business owner started calling them saying, why are we not number one in Google? Our websites look horrible compared to our competitors. She would just use a burner phone or a burner number and you couldn't reach her. So the realtor said that she wanted to talk to me about working with me instead because I took pride in what I was doing and she hadn't seen anything like that. Because I wanted everything to be at the agency level. But, you know, back then in the mid 90s, they didn't have Wix and Weebly and Squarespace and all of this. But thank God, because these do it yourself projects I've seen over and over and over again over the course of 30 plus years since the internet began. I've seen these things do more harm than I've seen them do good. I've seen these hobble more businesses than help. And it's not a fault of the business owner or necessarily the tool. It's that the two don't go together. Yeah. And most of the time they don't really know what they're doing with one versus the other. Well, that's exactly the case. If I could take those words and string them out, that's exactly the nail on the head. Because unless you're already an expert in SEO, e-commerce, content marketing, Website branding. Design. Yeah. And so unless you're already an expert in those, how are you going to know what to select or what to enter. You won't. Yeah. And, and, and who wants to go work with a lawyer or a coach or a business consultant or whomever if their website looks like something a, kid, a child did? Yeah. You don't trust them. So in your, in your experience, what are like the three mistakes you see like a lot of small businesses make with their website design, their SEO? What is the, the biggest mistakes you see most small businesses make with that? Not- Number one is this concept of let's throw enough rice at the wall and think that some of it will stick. Or What do you mean um, by I, that? Uh, I think another way of saying it is I think it was T.D. Jakes who said, jump and, and expect to grow wings on the way down. I think he said <laughs> something like that. And I love T.D. Jakes. I think he's great, but I don't think it applies. Um, what does that mean? It means that they just start throwing things together or experimenting with tools when they should be looking at goals and objectives. Got it. So instead of just making a website for website's sake, realize why you're making a website and what's the purpose of who it's supposed to retain. Right. Because let's be, let's get real. If you create a website and it has no SEO or incorrect SEO, which could be even worse, 
And for those who don't know SEO is how you outrank competitors online, okay? So if your website has no SEO or incorrect SEO or worse yet, you don't even know what SEO is and you don't care. If you're not using e-commerce to process payments, you're literally seeding ground to your larger competitors who are eating your lunch. You're literally leaving money on the table. You're literally hurting yourself when you don't need to. And you could be losing months or years that you could be making money or outranking competitors. So this whole idea of do it yourself, everything do it yourself um, is disastrous for most businesses. I mean, look, if you look at the Small Business Administration, they tell you, and Forbes has this as well, and I have this on my own website, dms.blue, it's all over my website. The overwhelming majority of businesses and nonprofits are gonna be gone within their first two to three years, kaput. Yeah. It doesn't mean the business owners are bad people. It means you're not an expert. You need an expert's help. If you care about what you're doing, if it's a hobby and you're just doing it for fun, well, who cares? Do whatever you want. But if you're doing it to pay a mortgage or rent or support your family, to me, that's real. The time mm -hmm. for game, the, the time for games at that point is over. And I know what it's like. I've been through uh, times where I didn't know if we were going to be able to pay the rent that month. I know what that's like, and I wasn't willing to gamble my wife and our, uh, um, our ability to live underneath the roof. I wasn't willing to gamble that. So I would do what it took to run a business. So if it's a hobby and you don't care, then do it yourself is fine. If Got what it. you're doing doesn't matter to you. But what if I can hear my audience saying right now, hey, David, I just don't but, have it. But, <laughs> Yeah, I, I could hear them saying, I just don't have the money. I want to start. I'm starting. I have a side hustle. I just don't have the money to hire a professional like you. Right. Can I, use the, can I use expletives on your podcast? Yes, Jim? yes, yes. Feel free. Here's my, here's my answer to that. Bullshit. <laughs> I'm calling bullshit because here's the truth. If you've ever needed, if you've ever been between jobs and you've ever had a need to have a root canal, they're not cheap. They're not free. The dentist doesn't care at all. The dentist doesn't give two shits whether you have benefits or you don't, whether you have a job or you don't. If you've ever had your car break down and you're in between jobs, you don't have a lot of money. The mechanic doesn't give two shits whether you can afford it or they don't, or you're a good person and it's not right. They don't care. You put it on your credit card and you pay it down. Now, I'm not saying that I have that same mindset OK, what I am saying is that you if you want to get from I'm not getting any customers to I am getting customers spending three thousand dollars so that you can make thirty thousand dollars six months later is realistic. It's doable. Got it. There are businesses out there who are spending three thousand dollars a month to put ads at bus stops or on billboards or on the side of bosses or God help them in yellow page, uh, yellow pages, phone books. Yeah. I know there are people still doing that today for that same amount of money. You could have a professionally constructed, beautiful agency level website with local SEO and actually work with a professional who's going to care about you and want to see you succeed and going to want you to outrank competitors because they'll be so happy to have someone with even a moderate, a uh, realistic uh, budget range. I mean, I remember 10 years ago when I would put an ad in the newspaper for my LLC, it was $3,000 to put an ad in the paper for several uh, weeks. Mm -hmm. The newspaper would not talk to you if you said, I can't afford it, or that's too much money. They would say, sir, I, I don't have time for this. I've got to take other calls. Have a nice day. And they never guarantee results. And the minute you stop paying, whatever phone calls you would get would stop Indeed. coming in. Got it. Yeah, That's it. To me. Yeah, the, out of the newspaper. Right. So what did you see is like one of the second mistakes that they make with marketing? Because the first one is not, you know, doing it themselves. What's the second one, do you say? Uh, the second one would be putting your ducks in a row, organizing very specifically who is your ideal audience 
And a lot of people who are new to business will say that my audience is everybody. You know, um, who do you want to date? Anybody with a pulse? That's not going to work, <laughs> right? So you 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 get what you put out. You get what you put in. It's a spiritual principle, but it's also a business principle called cause and effect. You get out what you put in. And, um, you know, not wanting to invest because you don't have enough money is a fallacy of just putting it on your credit card, just saying, I'm willing to pay 3000 so I can make 30000 in six months. I believe in my business. I want to work with a professional. I'm going to look at testimonials and references and case studies and ask the person questions and try to become comfortable with this concept I may be unfamiliar with. The other part is putting everything together in an organized, deliberate way. So you know, before you talk to someone like me, who is your ideal consumer? Where did they live? What, what do they do online? What do they read? So we know who to target and where to target them online very specifically. What is your SEO? Who are your competitors? Because you can learn an awful lot from your competitors. So, I mean, it's staggering to think how many people don't look at their competitors. From my perspective, and I learned this back in the 90s, if you wanted to learn how to create an agency level website, you would look at how they were doing it in New York, Boston, Toronto, LA, Miami, uh, you know what, maybe Paris. Yeah. You and London. Look, right, London. You would look at how, how does, if I want to see how should I design a lawyer's website? I would look up lawyers in New York and LA and Boston and Toronto and so on. If I want to look up a, a, a lawnmower, a, a, what do they call it, where they take care of you, a lawn care company, I would look up lawn care in New York and LA and Toronto and so on. And they're going to be the cream of the crop. Yeah. So you look at how they do it. And secondly, I would say another huge mistake, if I could add a number three, I don't know if you're going to yeah, ask. Me. Yeah, I said three, I said three. So, But number three is realize whether you believe it's a hoax or not, COVID is here. Everybody needs to be able to use their company website to maximize time and consolidate overhead. What does that mean? That means whatever it is that you do, I should be able to go to your company website and fill my needs. If you're a pharmacy owner, I should be able to go to your website and fill a prescription online. I should have it delivered to my home. It shouldn't be a big deal. If you're a restaurant or bar owner, I should be able to go to your website, place an order for food or whatever it is that I want. It should work easily, just like Domino's, and they should be able to deliver it to my door. And there's plenty of excuses, but for every excuse, there's a solution. Oh, I can't do that. I live somewhere where they don't deliver. No, it's not true. Uber, Lyft. DoorDash. <laughs> DoorDash, Postmates, they're everywhere. Plus there's people looking for freaking jobs, you know? Yeah. So you can hire a delivery driver and pay him by the miles or work some deal out. There's always a way if the will is there. Yeah. So if you remember when the internet was still new, they were calling company websites portals. Yeah. And they still do in the government. Why is that? Is that antiquated? What was going on with that? They were calling it a portal because everything would work through the company or agency or organizational website. So if you remember, you'd go to the website and you would download your HR forms. Many of them would let you do uh, e-signature. I mean, good Lord, FedEx has been using e-signature for at least 10 years now. Yeah. You know, it's admissible in almost every court in the nation, I'm pretty sure. Yep. You know, so I mean, make it so that people can sign documents online, make it so that people can fill out forms and safely and securely submit them, make whatever they can't uh, fill out that they can download, make it so that they can make, uh, they can uh, pay bills online yeah. and place and, orders. And make sure it's mobile friendly, mobile first, like people are going from that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. People are not going to it. They're there. Yeah. 
Um, also, you, you raised a very good point. This is something uh, you said, figure out, you know, learn from your competitors. Um, and that's something yeah. that when I had my cleaning company that we did, um, we were trying to get into carpet cleaning, like residential carpet cleaning. And we had to figure out which way we were be going to be able to compete with like the big guys, like Stanley Steamers and like the bigger local companies. And all we did was just call around and we figured out that mm -hmm. they can't go into apartment buildings in the Bronx. They can't go into apartment buildings past the six floors because they have something they had a truck mounted machine and all we yeah. did, all we did was just buy portable machines and we started be, be, being able to go inside the buildings and go beyond the sixth floor and that and was I, our that was our that was our little corner that we sliced off for ourselves that we were able to go to these places that were unreached and the competitor wasn't going there they couldn't go there nor did they want to go there and all we did was figure out where they weren't going and fill that hole and market it like crazy to those people so while they could go to every other house on the neighborhood they couldn't go to that high rise and that high rise has you know 400 apartment buildings in it and former 400 apartments and all of them have carpets because it's regular by the building to have carpet. So, you know, we were able to create a very, very successful um, division for ourselves out of just calling around to your competitors. So that's a very good piece of advice you just gave out. Yeah. And you definitely learn from your competitors in marketing. We used to call that piggybacking. Yeah. And well, I actually, we called it uh, a profiling where you would study your larger competitors. Yeah. And I just wanted to add a, a, a number four lesson, which is piggybacking, is to team up with other related businesses that would not look at you as a competitor. Yeah. Yeah. So also that's a, that's a very good point. Cause we hooked up with like a handyman company who did a lot of those apartment buildings. He did a lot of handyman work in those buildings. And we would like when back then we used flyers um, for like local, yeah. some local more apartment promotions so we would put like their promotion their flyer on one side our flyers on the other side and you know pretty much they covered the cost of it but we did the distribution of it um so that was a great way of actually getting your cost and your distribution together and we didn't have to pay for it that's right so like what you described right there you know you found two di you had two different companies that were not competing with one another yeah however the services could complement and overlap with one another. So a business partnership could work. Yeah. And if you talk to the person and they can't see it, because in a lot of cases, business owners are not open to partnering unless they know you or they grew up with you. They're just not going to listen to it. So you have to go through 20 to maybe talk to one person who will be receptive. You've got to have a thick skin and be willing to do that. Yeah. You know, you also got to be willing to do things that um, others aren't doing, like what yeah. you described as well. One of the ways I used to make money when I was freelancing or working in between working at different agencies, what I would do is I would teach four hour exhausting boot camps. I mean, they were physically exhausting. I mean, I'd have a bottle of water <laughs> and, and a Red Bull. Got it. And I would do all day boot camps, uh, build an agency level website in four hours or less. Wow. I, I remember I paid the rent one day with that. I filled the conference room uh, to capacity. I think it was maybe 35, 45 people. And you're charging each one anywhere from 100 to $150 each, right? And you tell them, bring your laptop and everything. Here's how to log into the Wi-Fi. We're going to, I'll show you how to build an agency level site in that amount of time. And here's everything you need to know in advance. Don't ask me. I'm not here to, you know, we, we got to work quickly. And that would always fill the conference room. So if I was running a little bit low, I knew I could pay the, pay the rent in one day. Got it. All, I, all I needed was a conference room. Got it. And then that you was know, something that the competitors weren't willing to do and give away that much information in a short period of time. Right. Like you were able yeah. to find, find a way in in that. Right. Learn WordPress. A, a, a WordPress mastery in four hours or less. Um, Web, you know, website SEO in four hours, build an e-commerce store in four hours or less. Got it. So I those, could do that. Okay. So here's the thing, right? I, again, I, I know my audience, I, I'm pretty tapped into them. They're going to say, David, I don't have the money. What are some marketing advices or free things that I could do right now with just what I have to get my company a, a little bit more exposure, a little bit more and more customers? Well, first of all, you always have the money. Let's, let's be honest. 
There's no excuse. You can't say you don't have the money. We're all paying for Netflix and Hulu and so <laughs> Spotify on. and all the other Spotify, things. Spotify, all of this. If you cut back on, I mean, a, a cup of coffee at Starbucks is like three dollars, and it might even be more. Um, you, you eat out your meals. It's incredibly expensive to eat out your meals if you get groceries. If you want to save, you can, and if you want to work with an experienced professional, you can. It only costs two, three thousand dollars in most cases to get started and to build something. And then there's a much smaller fee to keep it going. So that's not an, I don't really accept that as an excuse. Okay. So let's say it's not, let's say they just say, Hey, what are, what are three things that I can do right now with my business? Um, right now that, that, that I can do, I can affect without calling the professional. What are some of those mistakes you see people not make? And, you know, let's give this audience some, some value. Organize who you want to reach, why you want to reach them, where they live, where they operate online, what their needs and pain points are and how you can address them and speak directly to their needs and their pains and your customers' customers' needs. Find out how you can address that and you'll be light years ahead of anyone else who's a a, a small competitor. In fact, a lot of your larger competitors aren't doing that. And like we said, study your larger competitors who are making more money than you and look at what they're doing that you're not doing. Online, that's very easy. You can look at larger competitors and look them up on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and look at how do they present themselves? How do they represent themselves? How do they communicate with people online, follow them and learn from them and do what you can with what you have where you are. I think that's from Teddy Roosevelt, but it's a profound lesson, you know, but as far as online, operate as an individual until you're, you know, a legal company and until you really feel comfortable with what you're doing. If you already have a website and you know it's not getting you the results that you want, then what I would do is say, don't, don't put good money after bad. Wait until you really have everything organized very deliberately and very structured. And you know how to create content. You know what your brand is. You're committed to the business 100%. Then, then you could set aside the budget. But if you don't have any money at all, or you're super cheap, you know, you can just organize and plan for when you're ready to take that that final leap. And I have a book on Amazon and a books a million and uh, Walmart called The Road to Digital Marketing Profits that takes you from the beginner newbie perspective and it walks you through all the terms and concepts and shows you how to create content that your ideal consumers will want. And then also helps you put together a business plan that you could conceivably take to a bank or credit union as well. Because if you were to go to a bank or credit union, the first thing they're going to ask you is, how are you going to market your business? And saying, well, I have no money. That's not going to make them happy. (laughs) You know, and if you tell them, I don't know, or you give them some, some excuse, they're not going to be happy and they're not going to need to give you money. You yeah, don't have a need to do that. They're doing just fine. So you got to be willing to, to get out what you want to receive back. I mean, I mean, you should put in what you want to get back in return. It's a transactional relationship, but a relationship nonetheless, that we get out what we're willing to put in. Nothing in life that is really good is free except for nature. And even nature, you can't just go wherever you want. Nah. You have to watch out for cougars and mountain lions and bears. You don't walk into their living room and think you're going to get away. Yeah. Um, and to piggyback on what you said with, sure. um, with with looking for your competitors, you just jumped on that again. Um, I always yeah. tell people to, to pick up the phone. You'd be surprised how much information a, a front desk admin or a person that picks up the phone can actually give you. You can ask some random question and they'll just sometimes just give you information that some is not proprietary, but you'll learn a lot more about someone's inner workings of a company, just calling them up um, and speaking to the person who's just working a regular $9 an hour job. And they don't really care about giving up that information. They'll do it out of the, you know, just by you calling. So, and that's how I was able to get a ton of information just by picking up the phone and calling. I'll tell you another uh, related uh, trick of the trade that I learned from all these years in marketing agencies and then in between those positions was um, 
almost all marketing agencies, the larger the city, the more often they were going to do this, was they had what were called open houses, mm-hmm. open houses. Now in marketing, we knew what they were. They were called, they, we called them farms. Okay. We called them farms because they were basically farming, uh, looking for talent. They were trying to bring in, you know, what they saw as cattle, basically they called it a cattle call. Oh. And these events were farms. And what they would do is uh, agencies would have open houses and you would go to the open house. Almost everybody would be in their twenties and they're all sitting around eating pizza and they're throwing darts and they're listening to rock and roll or whatever. And they're just laying around on couches and everything. But what they're doing is they're looking for experienced programmers and designers who will work for lower pay Mm -hmm. and they can hire. Now I would go to these farming events, these open houses, because a, I would want to learn how the agency operated. I didn't really care about trying to get the job or if I did, I knew that it was going to be a tough sell, especially Mm -hmm. after you're 30 years old, they're going to look at you very different. Um, they don't like older talent. They don't want people who are beyond the age of 30, 35. Yeah, because that means you because have experience. <laughs> you have experience. You're going to speak up for yourself. You're not going to take any kind of random shit. Yeah. But also, you may need to go to the doctor. You may need time off or something. They don't want to do that. So I would go to the farming uh, open house events, and I would walk around. And I noticed that the senior people were, would be working in their offices, very quietly where the rest of the agency would have all the younger people playing darts and eating pizza and dancing and so on and playing pool. The real people making the decisions, controlling the budgets would be in their offices working very quietly on the computers late into the evening. And I would go in there and I'd say, hi, my name's David. I noticed your door was open. Hope I'm not bothering you. What are you working on? And, and usually there, you would see them look surprised. And they would tell me, and then I would say, wow, that sounds really interesting. Do you need any help with it? I'd be happy to help out if I can. Would you be open to that? And of course, they can't let you do that, but it would open the door to a conversation. And then I'd say, you know what? I'd really like to learn more about what you're doing with XYZ tools or what your procedure for handling these types of issues are. Would you be open to maybe meet me for a cup of coffee and lunch or something, I'll spring for it, no problem. And then they would tell you something. And whatever they tell you, you say, that sounds great. That sounds great. And I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with uh, potential clients who were large enterprise level business owners who I may have thought were out of my league at that time. Yeah. You know, um, you know, a corporation or a really large law firm or really large a business entity that I'd never worked with one that large before, 500 employees or something, you know, even a government agency, I would get my foot in the door, so to speak, by taking that route or going in for an interview and knowing I didn't really want the interview. You just needed a way in the building. Yeah, I had a job interview for government agency who wanted someone to build, to retool their site. It was an awful website. Mm -hmm. And for government agency, it was woefully uh, antiquated. Most of them are. And they wanted to redo it. And I went to the interview. I was interested, but I I already kind of knew what their budget was. I knew it was pretty low. And I just went with the, the main purpose was to get into a conversation with them and try to get somebody on that committee to meet me outside for lunch or something. And, and even in, and ask them, what else do you know? Who else do you know within this government agency or other agencies? Yeah. And it was always a win-win proposition. Now with COVID, that's harder, but you have Meetup, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. Meetup is really good at networking online. Uh, most chambers of commerce, surprisingly, uh, are still not online and yeah. they're not doing anything to to have networking online. So you don't look to them. 
Yeah, so that's you just gave a big nugget. Like a, that's a great like hustle tip right there for anyone listening. Um, there's a great ways to get into a building. Um, that's also using the Chamber of Commerce's website. I've actually built. Um, actually you've gotten customers out of that too. Just going on the Chamber of Commerce website, just calling all of those people and right. asking for like just a coffee. You'd be surprised how much people actually say yes. And, you know, you build and develop a relationship from there. Yeah. Prospecting doesn't need to be difficult at all. Yeah. Lead generation isn't difficult. You can go to any Chamber of Commerce website, see all the businesses there. Now, if you're in digital marketing like me, you could look them up online and see, do they have a website? Many of them don't even have one. Yeah. Or not a good one. Or if you Google their name, nothing comes up. up. Yeah. And then you call them up and you say, hey, you know, I, I, I own LL, you know, XYZ LLC. I'm new. I'm a family owned business. I'd really like to help you. I looked you up on the Chamber of Commerce. I noticed uh, when I Googled your company name, nothing came up. Yeah. Is that, is that something that you're, you'd be interested in solving that? I can solve that problem for you very affordably in three monthly installments of $500, yeah. you know, whatever. Whatever. And that's another thing, too. When people talk about, I don't have any money, I don't have a budget. Yeah, you do. Everybody, you, we all, there used to be a thing called layaway. Yeah. And then There's also even a really good old song. Put it on a layaway. I mean, you could pay 500 a month for three months. I mean, yeah. come on. I mean, there's ways also ways of just like we're talking about it now, just kind of. But there's ways of creating lead generations, especially now. I feel like it's even easier because, yeah. again, you said LinkedIn. There's another one that's just sitting there, like Facebook groups. There's people in Facebook groups just saying, hey, is anyone there that can offer X service? And all you have to I do is just troll those 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 types of groups that are looking for services, and then you could just be the one there to pick up business um, yeah. without, without a big marketing budget or anything. Granted, it's very time-consuming, but when you're in the early stages you know, of building your business, it's one of the easiest low-hanging fruits. I don't even call it low-hanging fruits. Those are the fruits that are on the floor that you could just literally pick up. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of people don't know that you can search Facebook by topic. Yeah. The same is true for Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, I wanted to experiment with a marketing offer that I had. And I went on Facebook and typed in the type of client that I thought would be a good fit for that. And I found like a list of 10 right away. Of yeah. All the groups. These were people who were members of groups that I was already in. So I just emailed them. I sent them a private message. And then I said, you know, I noticed that you had brought up this topic. If you're interested, I have this offer. Here's the link. And I sold about three per, I sold three right away. Yeah. So, and you know, then you look for the comments. You can also find the related comments. comments. Yeah. And you get involved in the conversation and just say, look, I don't mean any harm. I'm not trolling you, but I noticed you mentioned this problem. I have the solution. I know this problem hurts. I've been where you are. I know how it feels. I'm just like you. I can solve your problem if you go to this link. And that's, there you go. Yeah, you just gave another great hustle tip. Like, if, again, for people who are starting off, those are great places to go to because, and then right now, everyone's, you know, the great part is most people are at home or willing to talk or jump on a five to 10 minute Zoom. Um, so you can set that up and just, you know, talk to people and kind of sell yourself very quickly um, and cut through. Um, so, you know, also one more thing that I want to kind of go into right sure. now, you know, we're having a website good, but a lot of people are now in the content creation game, right? They're building a lot of content for their business, but I see a lot of people doing it right or doing it wrong. What are some of your opinions on content creation now in today's the time? Re the reason so many business owners and entrepreneurs are in the content creation business, like you said, is because they're frustrated. They've experimented with SEO. Usually they didn't do anything at all with it or they used it incorrectly. And they're trying to find a way to get traction. How can I be visible in Google and Bing and Yahoo and on Facebook? I'm just gonna create content like crazy. And the problem with that is creating content without knowing very specifically what your unique selling proposition is in marketing, we call it your USP. Okay. What is your unique selling proposition? And if you remind me, I'll get into what that is. But the problem is creating content without a map and an idea 
of who you're trying to reach and why what your offer is, is like just giving random food to a stray dog. It doesn't really do anything. You're not going to get them to sign up for your offer or subscribe or purchase your items or, or pay for your services like that. They're just consuming. They don't know you. It's not building a real tangible connection. Yeah. You know, it would be like me being on a podcast and not tr trying to be friendly with you and not trying to, to you know, uh, have a really good conversation with you or offering to keep in touch. So you want to have content that speaks to their needs and their pain points and addresses their concerns, but also comes from a point of what your unique selling proposition is, what makes you different. If you're a business coach, how many other business coaches are there? I mean, millions. You're right. Everybody and their kid brother is a business coach. And if you <laughs> look, if you look at their websites, many of them don't have real business experience. They don't have managerial experience, many of them. So how do they know, uh, you know, how are they going to help you if they've never had a business, if they've never failed in business? Yeah, that's but difficult. They also, uh, what also I've realized is that there's a lot of people not being very specific, right? So, um, exactly. There's, there's, a, there's like, oh, I'm a business coach, but for like what type of business, right? So I've seen people who they are don't very, be people yeah. who are very specific, like I service only people who start mechanic businesses and it's like very right. specific and they, you know, and then they make it even more specific. They say, I help people who have, have European and foreign car, um, you know, um, mechanic shops. And those are the people that they focus in on. And I feel right. like doing that and being that specific actually helps your business grow because you're talking to one specific demo versus trying to talk to everybody. Right. I know, I know one coach, who only works with WordPress web developers who are trying to build their own business. And he charges something like $5,000 a, a, a consultation or something because he's the only one doing it. I know another coach who only talks, in fact, I know two coaches who only talk to people who want e-commerce help. Got it. But that's it. That's all. They make it uh, so now, specific and so narrow that that those are the only customers um, that will but come there has to you. Right, but you have to make sure that there's a market for that. Yeah. Because if you only talk, if you only want to coach people who do one particular type of thing, I can't think of an example right now. But like, if if you're if you uh, want to be a business coach and you only want to work with yoga studio managers or yoga studio owners, you may have a niche market that could work. Yeah. But are they really open? to paying money for services, you'd have to do the research. It depends how broad your, your scope is. You'd have to try it and really dedicate yourself to it fully 100% and then see where it goes after six months. You know, But you also, more importantly, I think you wanna speak from a position of real authenticity, which is very, very lacking online today where there's so much artifice and so much hollow uh, conversation where everybody's a spammer or a scammer or a troll, or they're selling some kind of infomercial or some kind of hack of the day or tool of the day or something. So you want to speak from a position of real authenticity and sincerity. And that's more difficult than it sounds, because if you don't know who you are and why you are, other than just making money, it's going to be very different. Because if I ask you, why do you do something and you say to make money? Well, that's a given. That's you know, like, they, like they say, no shit, Sherlock. Of course you want to make money, <laughs> you know, to support my family. Well, yeah, you and everybody else in the whole world. So who is it that you serve that makes you unique and different, that, that addresses their pain points? But also, how do you stand out from all of these millions of other competitors who are all over the world now? So you got to look at those things and be able to differentiate those. And one of those things is your unique selling proposition, which I alluded to earlier. Yes, yeah, so I was going to ask you with the USP. Like, so how does someone, I guess, yeah. how do they identify what their USPs are? Are there certain things that they should be doing or should be looking at to identify what their unique selling proposition is? Yeah, I need to write a blog post on that, actually. But it's basically your unique selling proposition is an intersection point where you take what you're good at 
what you love to do and what the market has a, a, a real need for that you can tell. And that market cannot be global. It cannot be imaginary. It has to be something that is local because all businesses like politics start locally. Yep. Everybody, when, whenever I talk to people about SEO, they all, I always ask, well, what, what do you think your SEO should be? Um, they all say, well, I, I want my local, I want my SEO to make me number one in Google. And like that, that doesn't answer. No. You question. want to be number one in your town or number one on your street. Or they want one. to be number one nationally. Yeah. And what they don't understand is it doesn't work like that. Yeah. You know, Domino's Pizza started as one pizza joint. You know, um, every company, you know, uh, uh, these big storage uh, places that we see everywhere, they started with one first and then they grew from that and they took the money they made and they invested in infrastructure. Also, the customer is thinking local, right? Because the, absolutely, when you think of your phone, you go say, uh, what's the closest hardware store around here, right? Like, or That's what hardware does. store near me. And it generates yeah. what's your local um, situation because the customer is not thinking national. They want to solve a problem that's right next to them. And if you can solve that problem and you're next to them and you can pop up right away, that's the reason why they would want you to be there. So you're very right. Think super local, hyper local, but make sure that you're focusing on that first and then grow into the national thing. And yeah. And, and, uh, and you brought up that really uh, very good point that, you know, that promote your business locally and grow from there. It's amazing. Look at your competitors and see if they're listed in Google, my business and Yelp. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how many businesses are not. Yeah. You're hundred percent right. And then if they do, they're not optimized or it has a bad, it has one bad, like, um, comment on there and one star. And then there's no other like comments or anything that can, there's no pictures. There's, there's nothing there. You can do a lot with just your Google, my business. And if you optimize it properly, um, you know, that can generate you, you know, a decent amount of money. Absolutely. I had an event where I went to go speak at a law firm very prestigious law firm and they contacted me and asked me would I be interested in speaking at, at this event that they were having it was marketing for lawyers and I said absolutely my you know are you going to have good food yes we'll have good food can my <laughs> wife come and, and 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 enjoy it will she be treated respectfully and 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 have good food as well absolutely and I said my only other thing is well first of all how much are you going to pay me but then also can I record this? Is someone going to record this? Because I don't want to sit here and give an hour long uh, presentation and it's not recorded. I could use this. So anyway, I went and on the way there, I took for granted that I'd be able to take out my phone, look up the law firm and find directions. Mm -hmm. You know what happened? Couldn't find them. I took out my phone. I Googled the law firm name. Couldn't find the damn website. Kept looking and looking and looking. Finally found the website, no map, um, no address. They weren't in Google Maps. They weren't in Google My Business. And I, they weren't in Yelp. So I had to call the law firm and leave a message and say, hey, I'm scheduled to be at your law firm in an hour. I have no idea where you are. There's no, I can't find it literally that really happened and luckily i had the phone number for one of the um, organizers of the event and i said I, I i need a i need some kind of address that i can punch into google maps and i did and it came up with like three other businesses at the same address or the same office so it's a complete cluster you know what and uh, so it was much more complicated just to get to the event now yeah. imagine, imagine how many clients they've lost have. because of that. Right. And if you lost one client because of that one, that could be $30,000 at the lowest minimal for this law firm. So we know you lost at least $30,000 could have lost hundreds of thousands of dollars because you have no map on your site, no directions, no Google, my business, no Google maps why not? Yeah. It, it would take a few hours to set it up. 
Yeah. And to optimize it. And, yeah. it, and yeah. you know, it's really easy to do. Um, so, you know, I do want to say um, a couple, two, two questions before we go. Um, sure. So one, how has being an entrepreneur changed your life for the good and for the bad? For the good, it's taught me a tremendous amount of, I hate to say it, but hustle. <laughs> um, I learned to hustle. I learned to respect myself. And I learned to respect my experience and what I learned through pain, staking, and often painful experience over decades of working for these agencies. I didn't really think that I could be a business coach. I didn't really think I had anything to tell people until I had um, volunteered as a certified small business mentor. I did that off and on for about 10 years. And I talked to hundreds of nonprofit organizations and startups. And after all that time, I remember one day I just stopped and I just said, this isn't fun anymore. I know everything they're going to say before they say it. I know every question they're going to ask before they ask it. Half of them will listen. The other half won't. 99% will be gone. In a year within, or two. Within, yeah, within two to three years, if not sooner, the law most will be gone. The only ones that you can really turn around are the ones who will really listen and will really do whatever it takes to turn their ship around. So after that, after that experience, that one day I just said, you know what? I feel like I can speak to anyone and anything about this. You know, I may not be able to uh, uh, quote specific metrics or something or some kind of data, but I know where to get it. Mm -hmm. And it gave me a tremendous amount of confidence and respect for experience. And what, what did I not like? Yeah, well, so the, the question is, what have you, what was, how has it affected you in good and bad? Yeah, the good is self-respect. Okay, the bad. And, and the bad was there were times when it was volatile. You know, there were times, like I said, where I didn't know, am I going to be able to pay the rent this month? Because this client who said they want a website is saying they have no money. Or this client who said they, number, they want to be number one in Google, but their budget is $200. I don't know if I'm going to be able to hustle fast enough to get this going, to, to get this going in time so I can come up with the rent, which is a rough place to be. But I always was able to do it. And that's miraculous when I look back on it now. I always found a way. Uh, and then when you work for agencies, of course, they pay you much more and you move up the ladder into your project manager as I was. And now you're, you're comfortable and everything and knock on wood, you know, thank God every day. I'm at that place where if I want to work with someone, I can, if I don't want to, I don't I have don't. to. Got it. And uh, last question. I ask this to every guest. Sure. Um, do you think where you've got right now in life is based off of your hustle or luck? I know, I can't remember who said this, but there was someone who said that luck is really nothing more than hard work and diligence. So I think, I, I, I think realistically speaking, that probably 80% was hard work and not being afraid to get dirty and not being afraid to say, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Or wait a minute, I can help you a lot more than this other person can. I might charge more, but I deliver more and I know it and I can prove it. Um, and I'm willing to, to put myself on the line. So I think 80% was probably is, is hard work and hustle. And the rest, the rest is probably just the blessings of the, the big kahuna. The, yeah. The source. Yeah. Um, and if anyone is listening right now and they say, you know what, I have the money. David sounds like a great guy. I want to talk with him. I want to see what we could work together. Um, how can they reach out to you? Where can they find you? Sure. Just go to www.dms.blue. It's my initials. It's what I do in my favorite color. You can also just Google. If you just type into Google dms.blue, you'll find me all over the internet. And if you contact me on Twitter 
or LinkedIn or Facebook and you ask a question, I'm happy to answer a question. But if you want a real deep dive where I really get medieval on solving business problems, you would want to go to www.dms.blue and schedule a strategy, a strategy call. Got it. I'll link all of that in the description so that you guys can reach out to David if you choose to, um, or if you need his services, definitely um, feel free to reach out. Uh, David, I want to say thank you so much uh, for being on the show today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your time, Jerome. I had a lot of fun talking to you. All right. Take care. Okay. And just like that, another illustrious episode is in the can. I would love to know what you guys thought of David's story this week. I would love to know what your feedback is. If you can, hit us up on Facebook or Instagram, H for Hustle Podcast. Or if you want to hit me directly, I am Jerome Fenton on Instagram, Jerome Fenton on Facebook, Jerome Fenton on, on LinkedIn. Or you can just go to h4hustle.com. That's h f o r hustle.com check us out hit me up there um, i'm gonna leave you guys with the quote i always leave you guys every single week is from the late great nipsey hustle the quote goes this game will test you never fold stay 10 toes down because it's not on you it's in you and what's in you they can't take away that's it guys peace boom, boom.